Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are pleased to have David Jewett to speak to us today. David is an expert on planetary science and the discoverer of many solar system bodies, including asteroids, moons, and Kuiper Belt objects. David got his PhD from Caltech and has held a position in MIT and the University of Hawaii. He is currently a faculty member in UCLA and the director of their Institute for Planets and Exoplanets. Uh, today, he will tell us about some potential visitors from interstellar space. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that if you have any question, please use the raise hand function or um, notify me in the chat. I'll find the right time to let you ask your question. And with that, uh, welcome, David, and please take the floor. OK, well, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> I will just get on with it. I thought that um, it would be good to talk about um, three different things that I've been working on recently instead of one uh, very detailed talk that might not be of so much interest in Princeton because you don't have uh, so many people working on solar system topics there to the best of my knowledge. So anyway, I'm going for breadth a little bit more than for uh, intense focus and depth on one subject here. The, the standard joke, which I can no longer make, is the two freaks in a conundrum refers to my, uh, my three gra graduate students. However, one of them just, uh, just graduated, uh, and so I can't use that anymore. I was going to ask you to guess which student is the um, freak and which is the conundrum, but we won't go there. So the, <coughs> the subjects that I would like to discuss are basically interstellar interlopers, um, uh, a comet in which uh, we detect activity where no activity is possible according to the standard model for activity. Uh, and then the, at the end, the uh, Trojan color conundrum. And I'll go through them fairly quickly and explain them as, uh, as simply as I can. Uh, but before we start, I found an excellent quote for these um, Trumpian times. Let's see if this thing appears. Here you go. This is uh, from somebody's blog post. It's the Trumpian description of astronomy, if, in case you need this at some point. Them astronomy, the astro Mauser, are all liars, 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 fake, 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 fake. That basically summarizes the attitude of a lot of people to what we are doing. And I hope that we're on the edge of getting rid of these people um, uh, forever. Okay, so on to the interstellar interlopers. So uh, these are, this work is relatively well known, I think. This is a very hot topic uh, and has been widely uh, publicized. So I'll skim through and give you the parts of it that I think are most uh, interesting. We have known for a long time that uh, planet formation occurs in disks and that planet formation begins in a kind of a gentle regime, an accretion regime where the velocity dispersion is small, but as soon as large bodies grow, the gravity of the large bodies in the disk can stir up uh, the disk and can uh, excite the motions of, um, of small bodies passing close to big bodies. So uh, growing planets can scatter and can even eject uh, material from growing planetary systems. So there's been this long held expectation that we should find um, lost bodies in the interstellar medium, okay? Um, so we all know about the Oort cloud. The efficiency of emplacement of bodies into the Oort cloud is probably not bigger than 10%. 90% of the objects uh, ejected from planetary systems probably are out there in the interstellar medium. The question has always been, will we ever find one? And the predictions uh, until, um, literally until a few months before the first one was found, the predictions were that this would be a very, very, uh, a remarkable and unexpected event. So uh, the first object is uh, this unfortunately named Oumuamua, discovered in uh, 2017. Uh, and in fact, we now have two. Uh, the other one is Borisov. So they're called one eye and two eye. I'll talk about um, mostly about one eye, since that is the freak of these uh, of these two objects. So here's a here's a pretty movie from ESO or somewhere showing this thing zooming into the solar system. The big deal is that its eccentricity is much larger than one. It's, um, it's an unbound 
body. It's falling into the solar system. The velocity at infinity is 26 kilometers per second. It's coming in backwards. The inclination is 122. And it came to perihelion at about 0.26 AU. It was discovered after perihelion on the way out just by chance because it happened to come close to the Earth. It came within about one sixth of an AU from the Earth. And that made it um, uh, barely bright enough to be picked up by ongoing sky surveys looking for near-Earth asteroids and other things. So that's the first guy. That's one eye. And one eye has turned out to be a remarkable body. Optically, it's not remarkable. Optically, there it is. That's a very, very long integration that I took using this uh, uh, Nordic optical telescope. Uh, the body is a point source. So there's no evidence for material being ejected. There's no evidence for a coma or for a tail. The streaks that you can see are just passing galaxies and stars and things in the background. Forget them. <clears throat> it's a point source. And that was the first surprise to me, that this body actually does not look like a scattered comet. Um, it doesn't seem to be releasing any material at all. So this observation was taken at uh, 1.38 AU uh, with uh, one eye moving out moving away from uh, the sun. We had a narrow window of visibility. The thing faded very quickly and we couldn't uh, see it uh, even many months after the discovery. The second one uh, is uh, uh, Borisov. Second one is completely different. Here are comparable integrations from the same telescope um, showing that it's clearly active. It's clearly ejecting material. And in fact, it looks just like in, in almost every regard, a, a solar system comet. This is what I would have expected to see from an interstellar interloper and Umumua uh, is not. Color-wise, uh, so here's a plot of uh, two optical colors, BV and VR, uh, showing a whole bunch of objects in the solar system. Redder is in the upper right, uh, less red is in the lower left. The big yellow dot, let's use this mouse, the big yellow dot is the color of the sun. Um, things plotting on that um, arc, the diagonal arc, have um, a spectrum in which the reflectivity is a linear function of wavelength. Above and below, they're convex and concave. We don't worry about that. I plotted a bunch of um, solar system bodies. Essentially, the thing that matters is Kuiper Belt objects are the red things. There are different families of Kuiper Belt objects, but they're red. They're all in the upper right part of the diagram. Stuff in the main belt um, is down towards the lower left, closer to the color of the sun. And the, the two interstellar objects plot as green circles, actually where we would find uh, asteroids in the main belt, not where we find Kuiper Belt objects. So that's the second surprise because the leading theory for the origin of the ultra red colors of Kuiper Belt objects is that they are primitive carbon rich uh, comet surfaces that have been cooked by a prolonged cosmic ray bombardment, which uh, tends to give this reddened color. Uh, and that's exa exactly what you might expect for something that's been floating in the interstellar medium for hundreds of millions or even billions of years. So it's not what we see. We see colors that are not uh, like the colors of outer solar system objects. They're like D-type asteroids, a bit like Trojan asteroids. We'll come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> you can see from the orbital elements, Borisov only came into perihelion distance of 2 AU, but it has a much more extreme eccentricity of 3, 3.36, it's staggering. Velocity in infinity is 36 kilometers per second. Now, the really remarkable thing, the, the other really remarkable thing about Oumuamua is the light curve. So here are measurements from uh, Mike Drahus at Gemini showing the light curve. And uh, the, the period from uh, peak to second peak is about eight hours. Nothing special about that. Many asteroids and comets have similar periods. But the range is remarkable. The range is two and a half magnitudes, a factor of 10. And so we presume this is due to a cross-section variation. We're seeing a thing that's wide in one projection and narrow in the other. And the first guess was, well, this is a 10 to 1 object, like a, like a, a Saturn V um, rocket, actually. And that was one of the early theories. It's a Saturn V-sized size, spa spaceship. I think not, but that was the first idea. Um, we now know that this amplitude is, um, is an overestimate of the axis ratio. It's more like 6 to 1. Uh, but th this light curve and, and similar light curves gave rise to uh, simulations like the one in the bottom left, showing this elongated 10 to 1 thing should actually be 6 to 1 um, passing by uh, the observer. So that's our first guess as to the shape <coughs> of Oumuamua. 
And it's special because we don't see asteroids that are so elongated. Typically, the light curve of an asteroid would have a range of 10 or 20 percent, something like that. A factor of two would be unusual. A factor of 10 is unheard of. Uh, and so this is a very, very strangely shaped body. The truth is, we don't know that it looks like the movie. And of course, that's the problem of the modern age, that people make movies and that becomes the new reality. We don't know if that's what it looks like. Um, and it's been pointed out uh, by Maschenko that actually a disc-shaped object, a, a flat, kind of a flat patty or donut-shaped thing rotating around some axis, not the short axis, um, is equally plausible as the cause of this light curve. So we have an extreme light curve. We're not totally sure of the cause, but it indicates some kind of a wild shape for this body, unlike the shapes of things that we see uh, in the solar system. Now here's the surface brightness profile quantifying the fact that there's no measurable outgassing from uh, Oumuamua. Uh, surface brightness profile uh, averaged in circles on the left and just a straight cut on the right. By, by placing an upper limit to the amount of coma dust near this body, one can estimate through a model um, a limit to the mass loss rate. And in micron-sized particles, it's not losing more than 0.3 grams, grams, not kilograms, grams per second. So staggeringly tight limit on the mass loss rate from this thing, uh, based on the surface brightness profile and uh, the absence of a detected dust coma. But despite that, despite the absence of observational evidence for mass loss, Umumua shows a strong non-gravitational acceleration. It has its own, its own inbuilt rocket. Now in comets, we see this. It's due to the asymmetric uh, loss of mass. Basically, the day side is hot, sublimates material, and there's a recoil force away from the sun. So this rocket acceleration, the non-gravitational acceleration, is commonly seen in comets. But it's very, David, strange. It's very strange to see it in a body that uh, has no visible evidence for mass loss. So the acceleration is about 0.1% uh, of the local gravitational attraction to the sun. Was that a question? Somebody spoke. Yes, uh, we, have, we have two questions from the oh, audience. Cool. Uh, okay. One from, um, I'll show who this is, uh, C. Uh, he has a question about, um, uh, maybe it's better if you ask, C. Um, yeah, I'm wondering why the 10 to 1 amplitude of the light curve is an overestimate of the actual um, oh, yeah. dot it, phase. Yeah, sure. It's because of uh, phase effect. So we, we don't observe this at zero degrees. Fa phase angle is, you know, sun to the object to the earth. So uh, if we were looking at the full moon position, we would see, in fact, an accurate uh, projection of the axis ratio onto the plane of the sky. But we're looking in at some phase angle as 20 or 30 degrees. Uh, and so we're seeing shadowing effects, and that tends to make the amplitude bigger than just the ratio of geometric cross sections. Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sure. We have another question from Jeremy. Sure. Oh, simple question. I mean, does one have a light curve in more than one band? Because if if it if they different uh, bands show the same amplitude, that sort of supports the idea that it's a geometrical effect rather than an albedo yeah. effect. Yeah, there are. There are light curves in, in different filters, different broadband filters, and they, they look the same. And that is basically the case for almost everything in the solar system. Um, so basically, there's, there's almost no evidence for a large amplitude light curves uh, or for actually any amplitude light curves due to albedo spots on the surface or compositional spots. Surface composition tends to be very uniform. The one exception that people think of is this big moon of Saturn, the Apetus, which has a, a dark side and an icy side uh, for special reasons. Uh, but we don't see that elsewhere. And, and the color evidence does not support any, you know, um, that interpretation of the light curve. So I'm pretty sure it's shape, although I'm not sure exactly what shape it is. Anyway, recoil. If, um, if this is due to the loss of mass, there's a little force balance equation right there where these things are, uh, are fairly obvious. Uh, the nucleus mass is, is the density times the radius cubed. The acceleration is measured. It's alpha, measured by Michele et al. Um, is losing mass. If it's sublimation origin, the, the, the speed at which the gas comes out is something like the speed of sound. So it's 500 meters per second or something uh, for a 1 AU distance. Uh, the mass loss rate is dm by dt, kilograms per second. And K is some constant, which is basically the fraction of the momentum of the escaping material that uh, can push the body around. So K is uh, zero if it's an isotropic source, because you know equal forces in opposite directions. 
and it's one if it's uh, directing material off in, in just to, directly towards the sun, unidirectional stuff. I measured it. I measured K for the best known comet, 67P, uh, Curium of Gerasimenko. It's about a half. When you plug in the numbers, <coughs> you find that it needs to be sublimating at about one and a half kilograms per second to provide the measured non-gravitational acceleration. Uh, and that's orders of magnitude larger than the observational upper limit to the mass loss rate. So that's a bit strange. So I don't know why there's no visual evidence for this mass loss. One possibility is pure gas. So we, uh, gas does not scatter very well. Resonance fluorescence efficiency is very small compared to the dust scattering efficiency. We, we can detect dust um, well, but we can't detect gas so well. Uh, so perhaps it's just losing gas, pure gas with no entrained dust. No, no other object is like that that we know of. Um, perhaps it's losing only large particles. So in principle, you can pack the mass into uh, large particles, which are individually optically thick, so you can't see the mass. Um, but then you have to worry about, well, how do you accelerate a very large particle with a, with a gas flow that's uh, apparently rather weak? Uh, so that's just very strange. I have no answer. It's just a very strange thing. Maybe the model is wrong. Another consequence of outgassing, if that's what's going on, is that the, the outgassing could exert a torque on the nucleus. And for a small nucleus, the spin-up time can be very short. So the torquing time for everything else being equal varies with the nucleus radius to a high power. So small nuclei have a very short spin-up time. This was noticed by Roman uh, in a paper in 2018. Um, but this equation is, is my own flavor of that from, from 2000, from 1999, apparently, geez. Um, anyway, so uh, the deal is that if it's losing mass at one and a half kilograms per second, oh, we plug in these various numbers, uh, I'll skip over their meaning just to save time. Um, we get spin up time that's very, very short. It's like days, whereas the body spends um, hundreds of days swinging around the sun uh, and uh, at distances where sublimation even of water is possible. So you, you would expect that spin-up would be significant for this body because it's so small. It has to be even, even a shorter time scale if it's really got that elongated shape because there's a bigger moment arm for the torque. Um, and you, you have to wonder whether the body would drive itself to a rotational instability. And so that would depend on the strength of the body. Of course, if it's strong, you can rotate as fast as you like, but we have evidence from the asteroids empirically that the strengths are very, very small, less than a, in some cases at one Newton per square meter for the cohesive strength. So what about that? Maybe it's not outgassing material. Maybe this is just a radiation pressure effect. So if it's radiation pressure, then we have this equation, where the mass of the nucleus and the acceleration are on the right. L is the luminosity of the sun. Pi r squared is the area. So we know various quantities in this equation. C is the speed of light. You can plug in some numbers and find that in order for radiation pressure to matter, you would need a, um, a mass per unit area of about one kilogram per square meter. One kilogram per square meter is very, very small. So if the density is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter or something, then that corresponds to a thickness on the order of a millimeter, which is like a sheet of um, plastic, a sheet of mylar. Okay, and this is the idea from uh, the guy at, um, at Harvard, whose name I briefly forgot. On the other hand, if you know that the radius of the body is um, 50 meters, then you can calculate what density is required in order for radiation pressure to be significant on this body and to give the non-gravitational acceleration. And the answer is like stupidly small, 0 0.01 of a kilogram per cubic meter is 1% of the density of air. It's about a thousand times less dense than aerogel and a hundred thousand times less dense than water. So, you know, that's tough to live with as well. We can't rule it out, I can't rule it out, but I'm just saying this is a very, very freakish object. So there's a summary comparison of one eye and two eye. Um, they're, they're both on eccentric orbits. They're both from outside the solar system. Uh, Borisov is more extreme dynamically than Oumuamua. It's also larger. I skipped over that, but uh, Borisov is a larger body. Um, we don't know anything about the shape of Borisov because its nucleus is shrouded in this coma. We can't see the nucleus directly. We know that Oumuamua is about a six to one axis ratio, rotates with an unremarkable period of eight hours without any clear evidence for having been spun up by um, outgassing torques. No coma at all on Oumuamua, a strong coma, a very comet-like appearance 
uh, on comet Borisov. Uh, we, we measure non-grabs on both one eye and two eye of about 10 to the minus three times the local solar gravity. In the case of Borisov, it's easily explained by outgassing forces. In the case of Oumuamua, one has to struggle because you don't see any evidence for outgassing. So you require about 100 kilograms per second to uh, push Borisov around because it's pretty big. You require only one and a half kilograms per second to push Oumuamua around because it's small. Uh, the measured mass loss rates are what I've listed right there. The point is that the measured rate is very, very tiny. The limit is very, very tiny for Oumuamua compared to the amount you need to actually cause the acceleration you observe. And they both have spin-up times that are comparable to or, or shorter than the time spent in the vicinity of the sun. So let me just end with this. Here is a plot showing, uh, I worked out the brightness of Oumuamua um, as a function of time <coughs> in the year before it was discovered. So here's the apparent magnitude on the vertical axis in the day of the year. So January 1 is day zero, or is day one uh, in this plot. And what you see is this thing hovered around 31st magnitude um, for the first part of the year. And then as it shot past the Earth, shot up to a peak of magnitude 20, it was discovered at time D, indicated in the upper right, and uh, exactly at peak magnitude, okay? And most of the time, it was below the horizontal dash line, which is the approximate magnitude limit of the PanSTARRS survey. In Hawaii, it was looking for asteroids and other things of interest in the solar system and elsewhere. So, you know, not much chance to discover Oumuamua, and it was discovered basically at the only chance that, that it could have been discovered. There's no, there's no other time when it was observable by the existing survey telescope. So that alone, this plot just tells you directly that most objects like Oumuamua have not been and, and cannot be detected by existing surveys. Even the one we got can't be detected most of the time. So when you work through that, what you find is the number density of these bodies in the solar system near the Earth needed to give rise to the probability of detecting Oumuamua with uh, the known characteristics of the PanSTARRS survey. The number density is about 0.1 per cubic AU, one every 10 cubic AUs, or if you like, 10 to the 15 per cubic parsec, okay? That also means that inside the orbit of Neptune, 30 AU radius, there are 10,000 similar objects at any one time, assuming this density is, is uniform through the solar system and we have no reason to think otherwise. Um, and that means since they take about 10 years to cross the solar system, they come in at a rate of a thousand per year and they leave presumably at the same rate of a thousand per year. So there are three per day. Three will come in today and three will leave today of these interstellar bodies, which is absolutely staggering. Now, if one is brave enough to make the extrapolation to the entire Milky Way galaxy, the numbers are incredible. 10 to the 25 or 10 to the 26 of Oumuamua-like objects exist in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. That's 10 to the 14 or 15 per star, corresponding to maybe 1% or 10% of an Earth mass per star. So that's not unreasonable given what we think about the mass of comets in the Oort cloud itself, not very well known, given what we know about planet formation, maybe that hangs together. But still, the numbers are astonishing. I think they're completely it, astonishing. Yeah. We have a question from Roman. Yes. So David, this number that you mentioned, you know, 0.1 Earth mass uh, per uh, star, uh, that uh, number does not take into account the size distribution of, of uh, uh, objects. I mean, if Absolutely you not. take yeah. into account that most of the mass is sitting in much bigger objects, you have to multiply this number by, I don't know, several orders of uh, magnitude if all of them were rejected from their parent systems uh, in the same uh, way, which we naturally expect if the rejection is done by some massive uh, objects. Yeah. So that's kind of unavoidable and it, you know, just uh, naturally boosts up this estimate to some pretty uh, scary, uh, scary this, is, this is true depending on the size distribution, which is not yes. well known. So we don't really know the size distribution of comet nuclei. Um, we only can observe objects which have already been processed basically by uh, sublimation losses near the sun. So we, we struggle with that, but I agree with you in principle. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be bigger than this number. And I have a, I have a short question. Uh, in this uh, previous uh, slide, when you showed the light curve, uh, uh, there was a second peak around uh, September 1st. Uh, has anyone yeah. 
looked in archival images. Uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, it was not there. It was yeah. not there. Okay, the, the brightness depends on, you know, the distance from the Earth and the distance from the Sun and the phase angle. Yes, you know, like full moon and new moon, with very, di very different brightnesses. So that's why the curves have these funny shapes. It's a combination of distance from the Earth and the Sun and the changing phase angle. Right. And it just worked out great for Oumuamua at the right time. Anyway, so that's it. So there are many questions, right? There are not, not many answers. The biggest one for me is why, why are these two things so different? Why is one eye so different? Um, from from two I, um, do they in fact sample unrelated populations? I mean, could it be that within two years we've got two different interstellar populations passing through the solar system? Could be, but that that itself is remarkable. How long have these things been out there? Um, you know, once they're out, they never hit um, a star. They they basically don't even come close to stars um, uh, on a on a ten hundred million year time scale. Uh, and where do they come from? Are they in fact distributed? Milky Way galaxy wide, or are they being shot into us from some nearby source, some star formation region nearby, sending a bunch of bodies in our, in our direction, causing us to overestimate the population of these bodies on a galactic basis. So anyway, that's um, Umumua, a definite freak. Okay, I'll move on, um, since I'm already way behind time. Second one. Um, this is a comet, so it's two th they all have terrible names. 2017 K2, it's a long period comet. And, uh, you know, I can hear you saying, big deal, who cares, just another comet. There are thousands, no nobody cares. Well, I care. So comets are uh, interesting. The basic physical model of comets has been around for 70 years. It was proposed by Fred Whipple in 1950. And he was the first person to realize that the, the essential properties of a comet are determined by sublimation of water ice. So the dominant cometry volatile is water ice. And uh, water ice uh, sublimates appreciably inside the orbit of Jupiter. The radiation temperatures you find inside the orbit of Jupiter are sufficient to drive sublimation. And the model for activity is you have ice and dust packed together in the nucleus, put in there at some uh, early time during the formation process in, in, the, in the protoplanetary disk. Um, the sublimation of the ice creates gas. The gas flows under the pressure gradient out into the surrounding vacuum, into the interplanetary medium. And so there's a radial wind that comes out of the nucleus and the radial wind drags out embedded dust particles and projects them into the coma. And then they're pushed away by radiation pressure to make a tail. That's the basic idea. So if that were all that happens with comets, they would only be seen uh, to be active inside the orbit of Jupiter. And actually to first uh, level, that's true. So most comets are detected within one or two or three AUs of the sun. By the time you get out to four or five AU, the activity has shut down and you're looking at a bare nucleus. We have known for decades, however, that a small fraction of the comets show activity far beyond the orbit of Jupiter. Not just five AU where Jupiter is, but seven, eight, even sometimes 10 AUs from the sun where temperatures are too low for the sublimation of water ice to occur. It's a rock, it's frozen. So how can that be? Well, one possibility is uh, <coughs> that heat is conducted near perihelion slowly into the interior and can vaporize internal ices uh, with a lag, with a time lag. So the heat is picked up at perihelion, but the sublimation occurs after perihelion on the way out. That's one idea that applies to some comets. Another idea is that there are other volatiles. It's not just water, there are other ices in comets and they can, they can um, sublimate at larger distances from the sun. And still another idea is that uh, comet ice is amorphous because it formed at very low uh, temperatures and very low pressures uh, in the protoplanetary disk. And uh, the natural form of the ice is, is amorphous ice, but that amorphous ice has a crystallization time which is less than the orbit period inside about the orbit of Saturn. So uh, crystallization of amorphous ice uh, is uh, exothermic and in principle can drive activity uh, at distances where water ice alone, crystalline water ice cannot sublimate. So crystallization is another possibility. Although I must say we have no proof yet that there is amorphous ice in comets that is the natural form um, for ice formed at low temperature and low uh, low density. So anyway, we have this problem. What's going on? Why do we have activity far from the sun? 
So the big deal with 2017 K2, which I'll just call K2, is that it's active not just at the orbit of Jupiter, not just at the orbit of Saturn, not just at the orbit of um, Uranus, but even beyond that. So it's active at incredible distances and incredibly low temperatures. And it's a, it presents a challenge to models of cometary activity, as I'll just describe briefly right now. So here's the orbit of this thing. It's also hyperbolic, but barely so. And so the, the, the eccentricity is marginally above one, essentially because of perturbations, planetary perturbations. So we, we have integrated it backwards, and we know that it has been through the solar system before, millions of years ago. Um, uh, and that its eccentricity is slightly bigger than one because of scattering by the planets. It's never going to come back uh, because of that. Uh, but in the past, the eccentricity was less than one. So this is an Oort cloud comet that's drifting in. The perihelion is uh, close to the orbit of Mars. Perihelion is coming up still in 2022. It takes a long time to fall into Mars. It's coming in roughly perpendicular to the solar system. Okay, so here, here are some integrations, some backward integrations of clones. Um, and, you know, there's a probability distribution, but it looks like the um, previous orbit uh, period was about 5 million years, seven major axis, 28,000 years, so aphelion was roughly twice that. Eccentricity is, instead of 1.0001, was 0.49s, so a little bit um, uh, less than one, so it's bound. It's an Oort cloud comet <clears throat> that's just been scattered out for the last time. All right, so it looks like that. So, you know, to me, it looks like a globular cluster. Um, it's about as big as Jupiter. <clears throat> um, and this appearance is immediately interesting and informative. So it doesn't have a tail. So this is a picture, this is one of the first pictures I took with Space Telescope at 16 AU. It doesn't have a tail. Why would it not have a tail? I mean, there is radiation pressure at 16 AU, there's radiation pressure. The only way I can think of to not have a visible tail is to have quite large particles. And if you have large particles, then the effective radiation pressure, which varies as inverse radius, is relatively small. And so you eject particles, but it takes a long time for them to be pushed back into a measurable tail. So that was my first guess. That's turned out to be uh, correct based on subsequent images. So immediately we know this is a strange body. It's ejecting large particles, not small ones. Uh, large particles far from the sun. Then uh, we went back through the archive. So my, my grad student Manto went back through the uh, archive and found an image of this thing, a pre-discovery image with the CFHT at 24 AU. So it was active at 24 AUs from the sun, where the temperature is 50 Kelvin or something, black body temperature, ridiculously low. So that's interesting. Here's the recent development, more recent development of the coma. We do have a tail now. I had some pictures uh, a couple of weeks ago, has a nice clear tail. Uh, but the basic picture of this body ejecting um, 100 micron size and even millimeter sized gravel sized particles seems to be correct. And the ejection occurs very early at very low temperatures as this body comes into the sun for the first time in a long time. Now the deal is because the orbit period is so long, there is no possibility that the activity is driven by conducted heat. It has no thermal memory of its previous perihelion. Yeah, it's millions of years ago, that, that heat has gone in, it's come out, has no memory of having come through the solar system before. And so all the activity we observe is due to recent heating, even at such vast distances from the sun. The ejection of material is approximately in steady state as well. And we know that here's the surface brightness profile, radius versus the surface brightness for this thing. In a steady state, the surface brightness profile has a gradient of negative one. That's because uh, by the equation of continuity, the density is one over r squared. But when you, when you look through lines of sight through an optically thin coma, you get back one power of the radius. So you get this minus one. The measured number is minus 1.01 plus or minus 0 0.01. So that's exactly consistent with um, an equilibrium production of material from this body. <coughs> um, and so we have this very strange object that's producing material at about 50 kilograms per second at 20, uh, 15, 20, 25 AUs from the sun by some process to be determined. Um, 
and producing particles which are large. Those micron sized particles, which should be the easiest ones to launch in the standard model are not there. We don't see them, we don't see the tail. So the body is uh, getting brighter with time. If you take the brightness and extrapolate back to ask when was the brightness zero, you can estimate when the activity began. And it looks to me like it began uh, at least in uh, 2012, maybe before. In 2012, it was about 26 AUs from the sun, so just inside the Kuiper belt. So it's in a regime that's never been observed before. You know, most comets are, again, observed one, two, three AUs from the sun, a tiny fraction are active beyond Jupiter, and they're already mysterious. This thing is active essentially out to the Kuiper belt. Very weird. Now then, sublimation. So energy balance equation at the top. On the left is the absorbed power from the sun. The first term is the radiation term. The second term is a sublimation term. You take energy and you break bonds uh, in a volatile molecule and you cause gas to escape with a flux Fs. So that flux is plotted on the vertical axis for different species. The red curves are water for two temperature regimes. <coughs> and as I say, water dies very quickly with increasing distance from the sun. Very quickly. Flux, the flux of water is too small to expel dust particles. Yeah. We have a question from Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, is it possible they collided with something? How, how much kinetic it's possible, energy one would be? Unlikely. It's all, that's the, everybody well, wants everything. When, when the unlikely is, is <laughs> been eliminated, then well, yeah. impossible has been eliminated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's coming in at 88 degrees. So it's very, very far above the midplane of the solar system. So it, it would be extremely interesting if it collided with something up there. <laughs> in fact, the thing it collided with would be as interesting as the comet itself. So I, I think that's very unlikely. That would be the, the least likely explanation for me. But I, I understand that's a, a, there's a natural tendency to want to go for that. Uh, but I think it's very improbable. I, I have also curves. The black curve is for CO2, just pure CO2. And the blue curve is for pure, C, pure CO. Um, and so you can see that CO is more volatile, sublimates to much larger distances. So maybe we just have um, a, a carbon monoxide comet. It's got a lot of carbon monoxide because it's been in the Oort cloud. It can preserve carbon monoxide. The temperature in the Oort cloud is 10. You can uh, keep CO temperatures uh, below maybe 25 or 30 Kelvin, something like that. You can keep it almost indefinitely. So perhaps it's just CO rich because it's been cold in the Oort cloud for a long time despite the fact that it's made a, at least one previous passage through the inner solar system. But it's not that, um, not that simple, actually. It turns out to be kind of um, tricky because in the standard model, dust particles are expelled when the drag force on the particle is bigger than the weight force pulling it down. But the standard model, this is the Whipple model, the standard model completely neglects something that we all know is very important, as I can show right now. You can't see it, but I can rub my finger on, on the desk, and I have a lot of dust particles stuck on my finger. So they're sticky forces. So dust, small particles stick to each other and stick to other things. And the sticky forces um, uh, vary inversely with the size. So they're more important for small particles than for big ones. So that really screws things up. Now I plot on this diagram uh, an estimate from the thermal equilibrium uh, sublimation equation just, just shown you. Um, uh, an estimate for the <coughs> gas pressure <coughs> produced in equilibrium sublimation of CO, shown in red. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the cohesive strengths of various relevant things. So there's lunar regolith at the top left. That's the dust, fragmentary dust layer on the moon at the top left. Um, there's moon dust sticking to paint on a spacecraft at the top right. 2013 R3 is an asteroid that I observed breaking up. Uh, and was able to get a strength estimate from that. So these strength estimates are all quite large compared to the red curve. They're orders of magnitude above the red curve, okay? And what that means is sublimation, pure sublimation um, pressure alone is not big enough to overcome sticky forces, cohesive forces for these particles. The cohesion is due to, you know, uh, Van der Waals forces uh, holding uh, things together. So, prompted by a paper by uh, uh, some Germans, Gundach from 2015, I made this diagram, which shows the limits to the ejection of material. So, the black 
curve shows the sublimation flux for ice uh, sublimating in equilibrium with sunlight. And close to the sun, the, the sublimation is strong. Far from the sun, it's weak. So as you move away from the sun, you become less and less able to launch large particles. So the largest particle you can eject from the surface by gas drag uh, decreases in size. So the blue curve goes down to the right. But the big particles are precisely the ones that are not so much affected by the sticky forces, the cohesion forces. And so you have the red curve, that the particles that you can eject um, against cohesion uh, have to be on or above the red curve. So you want particles that are on or below the blue curve and on or above the red curve. Now we're out talking at distances 16, 20, 25 AU. What that means is we're at distances where particles are um, uh, too heavy to be ejected by free sublimation of CO um, <coughs> and too small to be ejected by cohesive forces. So they're in this forbidden zone between the red and the blue curves. So it's a very par paradoxical thing. So if, if this new treatment, including the effects of cohesion, applies, and why would it not? Cometary activity is confined to that little allowed zone over on the left inside for CO inside about 6 AU. So that's a bit of a puzzle. So the standard model, K2 breaks the standard model. And it breaks the standard model because um, of the effects of cohesion, which, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and gravity, which prevent the ejection of the particles that we see being ejected from this comet, this, these submillimeter sized particles. So that's the weird thing about this body. Okay. So for speed, the questions are, what drives the activity far from the sun? So we don't have enough gas pressure to launch big particles against gravity, but the big ones are the easiest to launch against cohesion. So we're in this forbidden zone. Maybe there's some other process. Maybe it's not sublimation of a supervolatile. Maybe it's a non-thermal process. Maybe thermal fracture is important, even though the temperatures are low. Um, maybe there's some other non-thermal process yet to be thought of. Or maybe there's um, a pressure buildup. Maybe there's a way to confine pressure from sublimation. So you don't have free sublimation into a vacuum. You have confined sublimation into a space, which reaches some critical value and then blows up the surface, ejecting particles. I don't know. So the comet is interesting because it challenges the existing model for sublimation. The big picture question for this object is, you know, what happens to comets on the way in? How pristine is pristine? We're always talking about comets as being Rosetta stones from the, uh, from the disk of the sun, but we're seeing that they are changing and evolving even at many tens of AUs from the sun, even at the Kuiper belt distances. So what happens to them before they get into the inner regions of the solar system where we study them in detail from the ground and with spacecraft? They're already not pristine. And then the last, there's some papers. Here, here's the last um, section of this talk, um, the Trojan color conundrum. So to introduce that one, let me remind you <coughs> that um, there is this thing called planet migration. Yeah, so you all know that. <coughs> In the solar system, uh, planetary migration was identified um, first and best from the Kuiper belt. So we see in the Kuiper belt, which is the set of bodies beyond Neptune, we see that various mean motion resonances with Neptune are heavily populated. So Pluto is one of these resonant bodies, but there, there are hundreds and thousands of resonant Kuiper belt objects, many more <clears throat> than you would expect <clears throat> if you just sprinkled bodies into the Kuiper belt at random. <clears throat> so um, the, essentially the only um, model of which I'm aware to account for the high population density of the mean motion resonances in the Kuiper belt is one in which the planets migrate. And so the idea is that uh, planets, while they're growing, are exchanging angular momentum with particles in the disk, maybe with gas in the disk. Uh, and that exchange of angular momentum can cause their orbit uh, size to change. Now in a one planet solar system, you know, one planet scattering some body, 
the scattering would give some energy and angular momentum to the small body, shoot it off to the interstellar medium maybe, and the planet would move in. We have a multi-planet system. Uh, and so the, it turns out the source of the energy and the angular momentum is Jupiter. So Jupiter, we think, moved in probably by a few tenths of an AU, maybe half an AU, and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune moved out. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the reckoning is that Jup uh, Neptune may have moved out by five or 10 AU, quite a long way. <clears throat> and as it goes out, it kind of sweeps up bodies into the mean motion resonances. So the evidence for mean motion resonances and planet migration to get together is pretty tight. I think it's hard to get away from that. <clears throat> now that idea has, in a sense, revolutionized the dynamical study of the solar system by converting it from this kind of boring clockwork system where everything is sort of repetitive and maybe there's chaos, but it's very weak and nobody cares to uh, a much more dynamic system in which quite strong chaotic uh, events can occur. So that's the understanding of the so-called Nice model. A bunch of people in France and elsewhere got together and explored this using n-body codes, black box models, to see how, what kinds of extreme things can you do with the solar system. And they found that, you know, uh, you can do good things. So for example, you can clear out most of the mass from the Kuiper belt. You can eject it through having uh, dynamical instability in the solar system. And you can tweak parameters in the model to explain many, many features of the solar system, including the um, existence of the Trojan uh, asteroids of Jupiter. So we've known of Trojan asteroids for 100 years. I think there are seven or 8,000 now known objects. The actual population is a big fraction of the main belt population. There's probably 500,000 Trojans bigger than a kilometer or something like that in these swarms, 60 degrees ahead of Jupiter and 60 degrees behind. And we don't know where they came from, but a very popular recent idea is that they're captured from the Kuiper belt. So as Neptune moved out, um, picked up bodies in its mean motion resonances, but it also scattered a lot of bodies from the Kuiper belt and blew many objects out of the solar system, knocked others into the sun and had collisions with planets, but also allowed some bodies to be trapped in dynamical niche populations like uh, the Trojans of Jupiter. So that's the idea. So this model is taken, I think, a little bit uncritically. Um, part of the trouble is that the Nice model is, has many parameters, okay? And so that's its strength and its weakness. It has many parameters that are not well constrained. So you can tweak it and you can get a wide range of, of answers, essentially. What that means is you can fit the model uh, to explain a wide range of observations that exist, but you can't easily use the model to make observationally testable predictions. So that's the main hang up that, that I have and many other people have with the, with the NICE model. It's hard to test. <clears throat> so a few, couple of years ago, I thought, well, you know, we know of another Trojan population. There are Trojan asteroids of Neptune as well, discovered by Scott Shepard and Chad Trujillo and some other people. Uh, we know not very many, but we do know of some uh, Trojan uh, asteroids of Neptune. So it seemed to me that if the Trojans are captured from the Kuiper belt, then the colors of the Trojans, so this is a very simple, dumb argument, but it's what I do. The Trojans should have basically the same colors as the source population from which they are derived in the Kuiper belt. So my idea was just to go and measure the colors of the Kuiper belt objects, of the, um, of the Trojan, uh, Neptune Trojan objects and compare with the Kuiper belt colors. So I did that. <clears throat> so here's that color color plot again. Sun is down there, the yellow dot in the left. I lost control of my mouse pointer for some reason, but you can see the big yellow dot. Again, the Kuiper belt objects are those red things up there. There is the mean color of the Jovian Trojans the blue dot, the, the upper blue circle. And I measured a bunch of uh, Neptune uh, Trojans with the Keck and I found a couple others in the literature. Those are the second blue dot, the Neptune Trojans overlap in color, the Jupiter Trojans, and they're quite different from any of the subpopulations that we see in the Kuiper belt. So let's talk about that. So here's the same thing expressed in a different way. These are histograms now of B minus R, the brute force, but relatively robust measure of the color. At the bottom, we have the cold classicals. So these are thought to be the most dynamically stable, most primitive Kuiper belt objects, least affected by scattering and other 
evolutionary processes after the formation of the solar system. And they uh, show a lot of ultra red material. So the histogram for the cold classicals at the bottom is pushed over to the right. As we go up, the next box is one, two, three, four. The next four boxes are the so-called dynamically hot populations. These are populations that have been excited um, in the Kuiper belt. So the velocity dispersions are bigger. They've been pumped up. The plutinos are the three to two resonant population. The scattered objects have a perihelion that allows some dynamical engagement with, uh, with Neptune. They have broad color distributions, but they include uh, ultra red objects. They go all the way up to B minus R of 1.8, even two, uh, in the case of the centaurs that you can see. These are bodies that have come out of the Kuiper belt. Then you have uh, the second box from the top, the Jupiter Trojans, <coughs> which lack ultra red material at all. The histogram is way over to the left, compare that to the other histograms. And the Neptune Trojans uh, are consistent with, and apply statistical tests, but the point is you can see by eye, the Neptune Trojans and the Jupiter Trojans are consistent with each other, and they are different from the other distributions. So the idea is that, you know, that's not what you would expect. If the Neptune Trojans are captured <coughs> and the Jupiter Trojans are captured from, for example, the hot classicals or the scattered Kuiper belt objects, then we ought to see more red objects than we see. So this color difference has been known for a long time. So actually since, so I measured the Jupiter Trojans, you know, uh, probably in the 19, scary, but 1980s, <laughs> uh, and the Kuiper belt in the 1990s. So we've known since the 1990s that the Jupiter Trojans do not have the same color distribution as the Kuiper belt subpopulations. And I always thought, well, that's because the Jupiter Trojans are quite warm. So they've been thermally processed. They've had sublimation stuff has happened. But you can't argue that for the Neptune Trojans. They're too cold. The Neptune Trojans are at the same temperature, essentially, as the Kuiper belt objects. So there's no room for thermal processing or chemical processing of the Neptune Trojans in the way that there might be for the Jupiter Trojans. Again, cumulative plots show the same thing. So I looked for other possible explanations. There's, there's some, going back to collisions, there's some probability of collisions between Neptune Trojans and other populations in the Kuiper Belt, uh, but they're quite rare and they're very unlikely to be able to affect the color distributions in any, any systematic way. And also we don't see any evidence for collision or resurfacing from uh, uh, impacts in the Kuiper Belt. So I contend that uh, this color difference between the Neptune Trojans and the source populations in the Kuiper Belt can have several possible explanations to be determined in the future when we get better data. First of all, it might be that as we get more data from LSST or somewhere, um, we will find that this difference in color distributions vanishes. It's significant now at the three sigma level, something like that. Maybe sometimes three sigma results go away, right? So that's, that's a possible future. Um, perhaps there's some other modification process, non-thermal, can't be thermal because the temperature at uh, the Neptune Trojans is too low, but some non-thermal evolutionary process. I don't know what that would be. It doesn't seem to be collisions. Um, or, or perhaps the Trojans are not uh, captured Kuiper Belt objects. They come from somewhere else where I don't know. So that's the conundrum. So those were um, a freak interstellar object, a freak comet active at ridiculous distance from the sun, um, and the Trojan color conundrum. And I'm a little bit late, but I'll stop right there. Thank you. Uh, we have one question from Ed. Yeah. <clears throat> My question is, you were talking about the difficulty of overcoming the cohesive forces of dust at such great distances from the sun. And I, as if I understand correctly, that was because the gas drag was not strong enough to propel the particles outwards. Yeah. What if you have a heterogeneous mixture of gas and dust and the gas can sublimate, build up pressure, and then blow out the, eject the, the dust particles uh, sort of like- Right, so yeah, so that is basically, I think the surviving, uh, the best surviving idea that uh, you have ice not on the surface where free sublimation is possible, but beneath the surface. And that's okay because CO is a very volatile material, so you can, you can do that at depths of centimeters. 
with conducted heat. So you have sublimation below um, a kind of a mantle material. And it can be an involatile, can be a refractory material. And then the sublimation pressure builds up to some critical level uh, and then cracks it and blows out material. That's, that's the hand wavy idea. Yeah, that's what um, I had in mind. Right. Uh, it's, and so, and that might be consistent with what we see on 67P, for example, where we, we see activity, but it's not entirely clear where the, where the activity is coming from. It seems to come from, from a geologically non-distinct area on the surface. So perhaps that's the case. Perhaps it's CO sublimation from beneath um, a porous, but not too porous, uh, refractory mantle. Yeah. So the small particles, the absence of small particles in comet K2 is almost certainly due to um, the sticky forces. So the small particles could be launched by free sublimation from an ice surface uh, because they don't have much weight. The nucleus itself is tiny, right? Less than yeah, sometimes degrees. comets show episodic outbursts, which I thought were interpreted by the, that phenomenon. Right, but this is Regular not like that. This is not episodic. This is steady state. Yeah, I mean, we know I mean, that from the surface brightness profile. And the outbursts also are not understood at all. <laughs> the outbursts um, may, in fact, be um, driven by crystallization. They're, they're quite nicely explained by crystallization events um, in amorphous ice. But the, the big deal about K2 is it's so cold, you know, crystallization cannot happen. The crystallization time is like a billion years or something at 50 Kelvin. Actually, it's longer than the age of the solar system at 50 Kelvin. So we can forget crystallization for K2 at these distances. However, the other beautiful thing about K2 is it's coming in, and I keep on watching it, it's now coming into distances where crystallization should begin to be possible. It's now at eight AUs from the sun. That's about where it, it could happen. And so it's the first time where we've identified a comet coming into the solar system um, at such a large distance that we can see it going through these various stages of activity. And eventually it will enter the regime, the standard regime where the activity is driven by the sublimation of crystalline water ice but we still have a couple of years to go to get there. So we're looking at a comet in a regime that's never really been observed before. So that's, our, that's why I like that. It's very cool. We have many questions lined up. Uh, next from Bruce, please. Beautiful talk and much to think about. So could you tell us in particular what the observational constraints are on the constancy or non-constancy or allowing non-constancy of the angular momentum of Oumuamua based on observations of? Oh, yeah. Okay, so so what we know about Oumuamua is, is fairly limited. We do have uh, these rotational light curves from several days. And the claim is made in the literature that the light curve is not strictly repeating. So if that's true, if that were true, it might be evidence for um, precession for example, of the nucleus. Maybe you have a couple of periods, this thing is wobbling as it comes around. You might expect that from torquing and so on. So that's, that's one possible explanation. But being a skeptical individual, I look at the light curves. Let me see if I can go back and find that. <clears throat> when you look at the light curves, the differences are not huge. And you have to wonder, there you go. You have to wonder, <coughs> about the accuracy of the measurements. So, you know, the body is, is not, um, not super bright, 22, 23rd magnitude, something like that. It's whizzing past all sorts of things in the background, stars and galaxies are there contaminating the background, the phase of the moon may not be good. And so small differences between successive rotations may not be significant. So I think it's a mistake, frankly, to put too much into this idea that uh, the light curve is changing on a day-to-day -day or even week-to-week -week time scale. Well, there may not be evidence of it changing, but how strong is the evidence against it changing? Well, you can it's see from the curve. Allowed. You can see from the curve. So the, the difference between the red curve and the blue curve, for example, is, a, is 10%, a few tenths of a magnitude. But this so, is all, I don't, how many rotations are we seeing here? It looks like just two or three rotations. Now, one, this, the assumption here is that it's doubly periodic, right? So it's a shape rotation 
you got you see the fat side twice and the thin side twice as it rotates. So the period is eight hours. So you're seeing for the blue curve one and a half um, turns put together from a couple of different days and uh, uh, similar for the red curve. Actually, the red curve is a repeat. The red curve on the right is a repeat of the, uh, of the main red curve. So you're just seeing a couple of days of, uh, of data. Okay. So I, I, I think you, you just don't want to push that. I mean, people have pushed that, but I think it's a mistake. Well, you have to push something because it's so crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to get too desperate, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right, next question, uh, Dan. Uh, hi, hi, David. Hello. Uh, but by the way, all my all my people pictures are frozen. I don't know what that means. Okay, there's not much to look at with me. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, so for the for the third hypothesis about the Trojans, I was wondering about the collisional hypothesis, right? So collisions are rare, but I was wondering whether for the Trojans, whether those collisions and the ejecta from that collision, you know, maybe the ejecta bounces around the Lagrange point so that the collision rate from secondary impacts might be larger than, than for the Kuiper belt object. Yeah, so the whole, the whole trouble, one of the whole problems with the collisional um, explanation for color variations in the Kuiper belt or, or elsewhere is that we don't see, and it comes back to an earlier question actually, we don't see hemispheric variations. So um, in, in this process, basically what happens is you have an impact into an asteroid, into a Kuiper belt object uh, or a Trojan, and you blow out material, some of it escapes, but most of the material comes out slowly actually and falls back on the surface. So you have what's called collisional resurfacing of the body. Now for any plausible um, distribution of impact energies, the collisional resurfacing happens more frequently locally than globally. And so you would expect to see strong rotational color variations because there's an impact on one side, it's showered debris over a big fraction of that one side, but it left the other side relatively untouched. And we don't see that. So we've looked quite a lot. Uh, so we did this in, again in the middle 1990s for the Kuiper Belt, because I thought this was the explanation for the big diversity of colors in the Kuiper Belt. Collisions make it blue, cosmic rays make it red, but that's not the case because we don't see this rotational modulation of the color. So that problem exists, um, I think, through everywhere. That, that's just a, a problem with collisional resurfacing, even if you have enough impacts to do collisional resurfacing, which I don't think you do. So I, my, my statement about collisional resurfacing was based on um, uh, a couple of papers. Now I'm losing control of my entire uh, display here. <laughs> that was, was based on a couple of papers um, some years ago uh, where people uh, calculated the rate. <clears throat> so Dong and Joe, I think Dong was at Princeton. I think that's the one. And um, a Portuguese uh, group um, led by Almeida calculated the rate and the rate is just very small. You know, that's the problem. There's two problems. Okay, thanks. Um, we have a few more questions. Uh, Scott, Jeremy, uh,